Welcome, 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 everybody. Today is April 26, 2021. Welcome to the first session of the Meet the Author series <clears throat> that, uh, that I'll be doing on a monthly basis. So uh, why today, you may ask, April 26th, 2021. My name's Kelvin Chin, by the way, for those of you who may be meeting me for the first time. Um, the reason I'm doing it today is because today is the 1900th birthday of this guy, Marcus Aurelius. So it's the 1900th birthday he was born, if you can do the math. <laughs> those of you who are quick with math. April 26, 121, he was born. Um, and uh, he, he was a Roman emperor, but we're not going to talk so much about him being a Roman emperor today as uh, more his philosopher side, and he's very well known historically for being a, a philosopher, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that and talk about some of his maxims today um, and my commentary on them that those of you who have read my book, you've seen that uh, that uh, chapter one in my in this book here. Um, but the series, let's just go hundred thousand foot first. The series is not about Marcus Aurelius. We're going to talk a little bit about him today because I'm going to explain to you why I chose this title and so forth, and what's the connection with Marcus Aurelius and all that. But the series is on how to live life more effectively. That's really what the series, you could title it. How do we live life more effectively, more enjoyably on planet Earth? So I say on planet Earth, why? Because many of you know that, first of all, I've been teaching meditation for 47 years. <laughs> how, did that, how did that happen? How did that fly by so fast? And, um, and I teach afterlife ser uh, a series of afterlife classes. So I help people with death and dying issues regardless of what their uh, fear, fears or thinking, uh, whether they have fears about death or thinking about death, it doesn't matter what their belief system is. And you, you, know, you guys know I, my first book, Overcoming the Fear of Death, it's available online and all the online book sources. So I teach those classes, but today and ongoing in these monthly series that we're gonna be doing together, I'm gonna talk about here, right here on planet Earth, how can we, while we're in physical form, live life more enjoyably? That's really what this, this book is all about, all right? That's what this book is all about, is how can we live life more effectively, more enjoyably here on planet Earth? It's not about the afterlife. This is not what this book is about, okay? Um, those are other classes that I teach, as you guys, some of you guys know. And if you're interested, and if you're not aware of that, you can just go to kelvinchin.org, kelvinchin.org, and you can check out the website and see all the classes that I teach, the meditation, the afterlife series, and this class as well. But this is focused on helping us now in the, what I sometimes refer to as you, some of you have read the book already, the continual present. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that continual present today, uh, actually, uh, in terms of one of the maxims that Marcus Aurelius uh, wrote 2,000 years ago. But um, again, just staying at 100,000 foot for a second. So today's, obviously, as I said, Maple 26, and it's be happening today, the session, because it's Marcus's 1900th birthday. So it's kind of a little celebration for Marcus's uh, birthday. And I give credit to Scott Madison, one of my students. He's in Australia. Uh, so he's probably, I'm sure he's sleeping right now. <laughs> it's like the middle of their morning or something. He's like two in the morning or whatever it is in Australia, three in the morning. I don't know. And, um, but I give public credit to Scott because Scott was the person who I think at the end of last summer, uh, maybe in the fall, he said, Hey, you've been thinking about giving a talk about these ideas, why don't you do it on Marcus's birthday? Um, you know, and why don't you write this book <laughs> and get the book out in time for the birthday? So th thank you, Scott, uh, uh, for that, for planting that seed. Um, so, but for Scott, you know, we may not be having this talk today on April 26th. Um, and going forward, uh, I'll read to you, um, 
those of you, 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 you uh, who've gotten the email from me, you've seen the dates. And if you haven't, scroll down to the bottom of the email. Uh, May 22nd, uh, all the future uh, sessions are going to be on a Saturday. Um, again, I'm in Los Angeles, California. So for those of you in Australia, it'll be your Sunday, which is also why I picked it. But again, for those of you in that part of the world, you may not be up at that time of night. But um, Saturday mornings in Los Angeles at 10 in the morning. So that works with all of you folks in the UK and uh, South Africa. Christine is in South Africa, for example. So uh, May 22nd, Saturday, um, we're going to talk about love. We're going to talk about love, the idea of love and unconditional love. And we're going to talk about the range of, uh, uh, about, of this idea of love, this concept of love. Okay. June 19th, again, these are all Saturdays at 10 in the morning Pacific time. June 19th, we're going to talk about forgiveness. And what about forgiving and forgetting? And what about this idea? You hear this all the time. People talk about, oh, forgive and forget. What about that? I'm going to talk about that concept. July 24th, cruelty and bullying. Why does cruelty exist? Why do people bully? Why do people do bad behavior? And what can we do about it? So that's July 24th. August 21st, spiritual insecurity. Why? Does it exist? And I'm going to define what I mean by that. Um, and the meaning of life. This is all August 21st. Uh, spiritual insecurity, the meaning of life, and the idea of perfection. Spiritual perfection. Or any kind of perfection, for that matter. September 18th, are angels different from us? So we're going to get a little bit out there there. We'll talk about that. Uh, September 18th. And so th those are the next, what's that, six months, I think. Um, and it will continue, we'll continue. And all of these are, those ideas are encompassed in various essays out of the 67, 67 essays in this book. So I'll just be picking ideas from the book and we'll be talking about them. Again, what's the goal? Help us live life more enjoyably in the present here on planet Earth in our current life. So um, those of you who've read, uh, and if you haven't, if, if you read the book and you skip the introduction, there's an introduction and a themes section here in the, at the beginning before chapter one. I suggest that you read it if you haven't yet, but I'm just gonna touch on a couple of points in the introduction as an introduction to our discussion today. Um, so in the introduction of the book, I talk about this Roman emperor, Marcus Aurelius. And um, I'm gonna come back and talk about who he was and so forth a little bit. Some of the high points that are not in the book about him um, as a kickoff of this uh, series today. But first, let me just talk about this, uh, this other person I talk about in uh, the introduction. I talk about this other guy, his name is Frederick the Great. He was King of Prussia in the 1700s. So remember, what did I say? Uh, Roman, uh, Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius was from the second century, you know, lived from 121 AD to 180 AD. Frederick the Great, 1600 years later in the 1700s in Prussia, which was a section of Europe, it doesn't exist anymore, but it was kind of uh, part of Russia and Northern Germany-ish there uh, geographically, okay? Um, <clears throat> but he modeled his life after Marcus Aurelius. And many biographers have pointed this out because he's written about it. And you can read and write, I mean, you can read his original writings, Frederick's original writings um, about this. And uh, the historians have thought that this is kind of odd. Uh, you know, this guy 1600 years later, uh, who happens to be uh, King of Prussia modeling his life after this Roman emperor. Um, so again, I won't get into the details that I talk about in the introduction here, um, but um, as I've said in a, a previous video on YouTube, on my YouTube channel, um, some say, some people say that Frederick the Great was a later reincarnation 
of Marcus Aurelius. Um, and again, in the introduction, I don't make that statement. I'm just saying that to you here in this session. Uh, but in the introduction of my book, I point out some of these oddities, these strange inexplicable, inexplicable coincidences between those two personalities and some of the actions and behavior that they did, okay? Again, you can read that in the introduction if you haven't already. But uh, for more information, I guess, I, I, was the way I would say it, for more information on this little uh, factoid about uh, Frederick the Great, um, there's a, a, a guy named Charlie Lutz, who was an early TM teacher who met Maharishi Mahesh Yogi in 1959, one of the first people to meet Maharishi Mahesh Yogi when Maharishi left India and came to the United States and started teaching meditation. This was before Maharishi even called the, t the meditation technique, before he even called it TM or Transcendental Meditation. He, he just called it meditation. And uh, the reason I'm saying this, for those of you who don't know my background, is that uh, I used to teach TM for about 10 years in the 1970s. I learned TM in 1970, November 1970. Uh, I learned TM and I taught it. I studied personally with Maharishi in 1971 and 73. And I taught it for about 10 years and I was an international leader in the TM organization. However, I was in the TM organization that was known to be the more science oriented, the research, scientific research oriented arm of the TM organization, the more education oriented, teaching in educational institutions, teaching meditation in universities and elementary schools and middle schools and high schools and so forth. Um, and the business, the business uh, side, uh, uh, in teaching in businesses, in other words, um, and, and sports and athletics. That was the side of the organization that I was in. I was not in the 1970s. I was not in the spiritual arm of the TM organization. So many people don't know that there were, it was separate. And there was a spiritual arm and it was called S SRM, Spiritual Regeneration Movement, is, was the name of the organization of, was more spiritual oriented. That was before the International Meditation Society arm. I'm just giving you these as factoids. You can look these up later. Um, if you want to research this stuff. Um, I was in the International Meditation Society or the Students International Meditation Society arm because I started the first uh, SIMS, it was called Student International Meditation Society um, a meditation club at Dartmouth College when I was um, you know, a, a sophomore there. Um, well, this guy, Charlie Lutz, was head of the spiritual side that I had nothing to do with. Um, he was the head guy of that for many, many years, for some decades, in fact. And the reason I'm mentioning his name, L-U-T-E-S, Charlie Lutz, is if you can find somebody who was part of that SRM, Spiritual Regeneration Movement, arm of the TM organization back in the 1970s, you might ask them uh, about this guy, Charlie Lutz, and if they ever heard him talk about Frederick the Great, because I heard recently, like about two years ago, I heard from uh, a TM teacher from the 1970s who I just met recently, as I said, uh, that Charlie Lutz laid out some breadcrumbs uh, about this guy, Frederick the Great, and some of his uh, other lifetimes. So if you want to, if you're an investigative sleuth, I'll call you, <laughs> you, I'm just laying out some breadcrumbs for you that you can, uh, I'll leave that for you. You can research on your own if you want, if you want to do that. You can find someone perhaps who was at one of Charlie Lutz's Los Angeles lectures. I guess he did that every week. Again, I never knew him. I didn't talk to him. I never heard any of his lectures or any of his material, but in the early 1970s, I guess, and in the mid 1970s and late 1970s, in the 1970s and maybe the 1980s too, uh, uh, he, he gave a weekly lecture in Los Angeles. And you might ask that old TM teacher person, you may find, um, you know, what did Charlie Lutz say about this guy, Frederick the Great? 
But let's talk about Marcus Aurelius. <clears throat> What's noteworthy about Marcus Aurelius for our discussion today? Well, first of all, as I already said, he was an emperor of Rome in the second century. Um, he was reluctant, to say the least. He did not want to be emperor at all. He, he wanted to be a philosopher. That was his, uh, and, and this started when he was very, very young. When Marcus was very, very young. Uh, this is a picture of Marcus when he was around 15 years old. This is a statue of Marcus Aurelius from the, uh, I think it's called the, 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 the Cap Capitoline uh, Museum in Rome, Italy. Uh, so that's him about 15 years old. It's not, it's not the usual, I'll show you the usual picture you'll see if you Wikipedia Marcus Aurelius, for example. This is usually the picture that you see of Marcus Aurelius. This is a bronze statue of him. Uh, that's typically the picture that you see of, of, of Marcus Aurelius. This is a biography by uh, Frank McGlynn, whose uh, work I, um, I respect because he, Frank as a biographer seems to have a very uh, uh, neutral, neutral agenda when he's writing biographies about uh, you know, historically known folks. Um, but again, Marcus, he was reluctant. He slept on the floor. <laughs> Some of the things he did, he slept on the floor, uh, would not sleep in his bed for, 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 for a long time um, because that's where philosophers slept. Philosophers slept on the floor. They didn't sleep in a bed. You know, this was, it was about thinking about life. It wasn't about the comforts of life. That was the, the, the you know, the thinking amongst many philosophers. And uh, again, um, remember Marcus uh, grew up in an aristocratic uh, uh, setting, obviously. His father died when he was three years old. So primarily he was raised by his mother and his grandfather. But even then, back then, uh, you were raised by tutors and nannies, typically. Um, but um, um, his mom was successful after some long cajoling and arguments and so forth, getting him to sleep in his bed. This was when he was like six, seven, eight, nine years old, okay, when Marcus Aurelius was very, very young. Uh, <clears throat> in his teens, around 12 years oldish or so, approximately. Um, you know, he met Hadrian. Hadrian was the emperor at the time when Marcus was born. Uh, and Hadrian is a well-known emperor. He built Hadrian's Wall. Those of you may have heard of this. Hadrian's Wall in the UK, Hazel, where you are. There's this law, it's, I can't remember, is it 70 or 80 miles long? It's very, very long wall, um, you know, 120, 130 kilometers long, something like that. And it has forts built into it. It was, it's, it's not just a little wall. It's not like a wall in New England where I grew up uh, outside of Boston. This is a huge wall. It's like uh, very, very wide and very, very tall and so forth. And it has literally has living quarters built into it at different points at times as well. Um, but Hadrian is known for that and for other things. But um, Hadrian was the emperor when Marcus Aurelius was growing up. And Hadrian took a liking to Marcus and groomed him to be his successor because Hadrian did not have any children, did not eat, and, um, and it was always the male successor, the male child would succeed. That was the, that was the tradition at the time. <clears throat> um, so Hadrian groomed him as his successor and Marcus moved into with great reluctance. Marcus hated this. He moved into, he was told that he had to move into Hadrian's palace and um, spent a lot more time with Hadrian that way, et cetera, et cetera, of course. Um, but um, Mark, when Hadrian was dying, um, literally on his deathbed for about the last month or so, uh, he knew he was going. Uh, Marcus was too young to be emperor at that time. He was only still in his late teens. And so um, what Hadrian did was he got uh, this other guy whose name was Antoninus Pius, who was, I think he was related to Hadrian in some more distant way, uh, 
second cousin or some, third cousin or something like that, but he wasn't his son. So because he wasn't his, his, his biological son, he couldn't just, you know, um, step up to the throne, so to speak, the being emperor uh, through the normal bloodline tradition. So um, as, was, as was the tradition in Rome at the time. So he uh, told Antoninus Pius and he picked Antoninus Pius because why? Because Antoninus Pius was in his early 50s at the time. So those of you who don't know, that was very old in ancient Rome. To be 50 years old was very, very old. Now, if when you were more of the aristocracy, you had better health care and you had better food and water and you know sanitation and all of that kind of stuff. So you tended to live longer than the, the mass population. The mass population, the it was the the, the uh, life expectancy was around 30 years old. 3-0, 30 years old for the normal masses. Now the aristocracy, you know, sometimes they live 50, 60, 70 years, even sometimes, um, you know, depend on, on the on the person's physiology and all of that stuff. But so they had a longer lifespan in the masses, but you know, 50 years old, Hadrian's thinking, oh, Antoninus Pius, he's 50, he's not gonna last that long. So, you know, he'll he'll get he'll get he'll last long enough so that. Marcus Aurelius will be in his 20s, his early 20s at least, and then he can be the emperor because he figures, Hadrian figures Antoninus Pius would die of natural causes of old age. Well, uh, and so what he did was he said, Antoninus Pius, I'm going to make you emperor, but it, so you, you're going to, uh, I'm going to, you know, you're going to be my stepson. I'm going to make you my stepson. So they could do that, even though it wasn't his actual son in the Roman tradition, if you adopted somebody they could become emperor. So that was a way of getting around the, the rule. So he adopted Antoninus Pius, but he said, the condition of my adopting you and making you emperor is that you have to adopt Marcus Aurelius. And he also had to adopt this other uh, Lucius Verus, who was also um, a, a, rel you know, a distant relative. So actually Lucius Verus and Marcus Aurelius were co-emperors for the first eight years uh, of Marcus Aurelius's reign, but because uh, until Lucius Verus died uh, about eight years into it. But that's just a quick aside. So he told this, said this to Antoninus Pius. The problem is, <laughs> is that Hadrian died and Antoninus Pius had a very, very strong constitution. And he, I think it was 53 years old and he lasted another 20 years before he died. He died at 73 years old, which is why Marcus Aurelius did not become emperor in his 20s as was the plan of Hadrian, but Marcus Aurelius became emperor when he was about 40, 41 years old. So, um, so Marcus, what does that tell you about Marcus? That tells you patience, okay? Personality. Let's talk about Marcus's personality a little bit, and then we'll get into some of these maxims, because some of these maxims are obviously reflective of his personality. So patience, integrity because those of you who know anything about you know we'll call it ancient history because it is ancient history 2000 years ago uh many many of the roman emperors acceded in other words they stepped up to the throne from killing the prior emperor or murdering them some conspiracy to murder poisoning them getting them knifed okay marcus did not do that with antoninus right 20 years he waited patiently um, and um, some other um, quick personality uh, traits of Marcus, compassion, tremendous compassion for the people. The people loved Marcus. He was an incredibly popular emperor with the masses of people and, and the Senate and the leadership as well. So um, he had the ability to lead in terms of military prowess, which of course the aristocracy loved and the masses to some extent loved that too, uh, because it showed the power of the Roman empire, et cetera. Marcus Aurelius was ruler of about 70 to 75 million people in the Roman empire at the time. The estimates amongst the historical experts is that was about one quarter of the world's population. So Marcus Aurelius was leader of one quarter of the world's population at the time, but he was loved by the people 
and by his military leaders and the other and the rest of the aristocracy, the Senate and so forth. Um, but he also had incredible integrity, as I said, and compassion. And one example of his incredible compassion is that um, his wife, Faustina, um, had a later, obviously, publicly known affair with uh, one of the top generals in Marcus's army when the general was off fighting in Parthia. So Parthia was the, uh, off in the eastern, eastern part of the Roman Empire. Um, and that general uh, created a rumor that Marcus Aurelius had died and that he was going to take over, he, that general, was going to take over as the new emperor of Rome. <clears throat> you got to understand that we didn't have media. Forget about social media. We didn't have, they, they didn't have media. You know, how, how, did, how did word get around? By horseback, you know? Somebody would ride a horse and have a message and that would, that's how the word, word got around. So it was easy to spread what we call misinformation today back then, which is what that general was doing in order to take over the Roman Empire. But it was found out by one of uh, Marcus's more loyal uh, you know, le you know, soldiers, generals, and um, the guy was outed. Well, the compassion that Marcus showed towards his wife for having transgressed, obviously, their relationship with this general and conspired with him, et cetera, not just having a extramarital marital relationship with the guy, but conspiring, Marcus did not kill his wife like 99% of the Roman emperors would. And, um, and he didn't put her into exile either. But I'm sure a uh, very heart-to-heart uh, -heart conversation was had, a very firm conversation was had, but she lived out her life in, in its entirety and she died when she was older, Faustina did. And um, um, she was the mother of six, of, six children. Of, for for uh, Marcus and, and Faustina had six children. Um, another thing about Marcus that a lot of people don't know is that um, nine of their 15 children died before they were 10 years old. So Marcus had experienced great loss of children at a very young age. You have to understand that at the time, the uh, infant mortality rate was around 30%. One out of three children did not make it to 10 years old. And so for the aristocracy, that's why they, uh, one of the traditions was that the nannies would, would wet nurse the children for many, many, many years before the parents of the children uh, spent much time with the children because there was too much bonding and it was just so was too, too painful for the parents. Now, unfortunately, if you were not of the aristocracy, you couldn't afford wet nurses and nannies, et cetera. So you, you just can imagine the pain for those of you who have lost children. My heart goes out to you. Um, and you may know that I work now, 2021, I work a lot with parents who've lost children and help them. But again, R Marcus was primarily a philosopher. And um, as I said, and he was a primary a philosopher of Stoicism. And so just in a nutshell, I want to debunk some of the misunderstanding in like one or two sentences of Stoicism. People, you, you've probably heard the phrase being stoic. You know, we use that phrase in English. Oh, you need to be stoic. And this phrase is, 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 is used correctly in English to mean, oh, to be very, you know, uh, stone-faced, to be very non-emotional, stoic, to be hardened emotionally, okay? That's how it's used in English today. That is a misunderstanding if you think of stoicism that way, that is a, um, a, a misunderstanding of stoicism. Stoicism, it comes from the idea of stoicism, but stoicism really is a balance of emotional and rational thought. That's really what it is. And it was a, it was a Greek philosophy in order to make you a stronger leader, 
without falling prey to your emotions. So it wasn't saying your emotions are bad. It was saying don't fall prey to them and lose perspective so that you can't lead in battle, for example. That's where this came from originally. Um, but then it was expanded to life in general. Okay. So be strong, but not ignorant of your emotions. Not, it's, it's, not, it's not about not having emotions. Yes, we have emotions. So the message I would say in a nutshell would be, you can be strong and not be run or overrun by your emotions. That's how I would sum up stoicism. Um, so again, that was Marcus's foundational philosophy in his thinking. And um, <clears throat> he wrote these meditations that we're going to talk about now, some of them. Uh, uh, we're going to talk about some of the 20, I think I have 20 or 21 of them in my book. We're going to talk about maybe uh, three or four of them or something like that, four or five of them. Um, but he wrote these meditations. This, what I have in here is just a sm small smidgen of some of my favorite ones. He wrote them why? He wrote them because it was self-reflective for himself. It was his way of thinking about himself and improving himself from a philosophic, or we may call a contemplative perspective, okay? He did not write them, just like I did not write these essays thinking I was gonna put them in a book. <laughs> he did not write those, what they're now called meditations. He didn't call them meditations. He just wrote these ideas down on, parchment and so forth, and they, somebody collected them and they saved them. Somebody saved them for 2000 years and then somebody published them, I don't know, a couple of year, hundred years ago, whatever, they put, pulled them together, but, and they called them meditations. But they're basically his daily reflections over a period of around uh, 13 or 14 years, mostly while he was not in Rome, while he was out on the battlefield somewhere, sitting in a tent, writing. So that's the picture you can envision him doing, sitting there, um, you know, by torchlight, writing these ideas down. So let's talk about some of them, okay? And you'll see in my book, in my own 67 essays that I've written over the last five or six years, some recurrent themes in what I teach in my classes, and I've written about in these essays, you'll see some recurrent themes about you know, what I teach and what Marcus espoused, um, and I think they'll jump out at you as, you as you read these 67 essays that I've written. But let's talk about a handful uh, of some of these, um, um, <clears throat> what I call maxims. These maxim means it's just a short, pithy uh, writing by Marcus. So again, let's look at living in the present on page eight, those of you who have the book. Living in the present, let's talk about um, several of these. Living in the present. So again, the, in the italics is the actual quote that's ob obviously translated. Um, and this is the, um, those of you who are curious, this is, the, this is the book of translations. I liked these guys' translations. And there's a footnote here if you wanna look it up uh, in my book. Um, but uh, I like these guys' translations. I have a number of different translations of some of Marcus's meditations, but I like the way these guys phrased things. It resonated with me more. But living in the present, um, Marcus wrote, even if you should live 3,000 years or 30,000 for that matter, know just the same that no one loses any other life than the one he now lives. Nor does one live any other life than that which he will lose. The longest and shortest lives thus amount to the same. For the present moment is equal for everyone. And what we lose turns out never to have belonged to us in the first place. So what has been lost is only a mere moment. Nobody can lose either the past or the future. For how can anyone lose what they never possessed? So, it's the idea of living in the present, right? Um, and, and that it's really futile. It's really a waste of time to be living in the past and living in what I sometimes refer to, you hear me in my lectures, in my talks, and sometimes in my essays here, 
I talk about the idea of living beyond our imagination horizon. So it's like, it's like from here to that horizon, you know, like horizon as in the setting sun, you know, the horizon of the earth. It's like visually, you can see up to that point, right? But you can't see beyond the horizon. That's it. So it's as if our imagination has a similar horizon. And our imagination is <clears throat> right here. And then up to that, and it's like after that's the future, you know? But our present is right here, right now. And Marcus's point is this is where we need to live life because it's a waste of our time to be spending our emotional life is what I call it, our emotional life in our past or our emotional life in our future. Because our actual reality of physical life is always in the continual present, right? You move across the room, you know, wait, I'm moving my hand, you know, it's, like, it, it's, it's always in the continual present, my, my hand, right? As I move it, the present keeps changing. That's why I call it the continual present because it's ever changing what the present is, oh, you missed it. <laughs> like, oh, you missed it again. You know, it's the continual present. Um, and so Marcus is reminding us of that. And he's also pointing out this idea that it doesn't matter how long or short our life is. It's an important point, I think, especially uh, for many of us, for those of us who, who worry about, am I gonna live long enough? or what have I done in my life? And what have I accomplished in my life? All of that, it's always, what are we doing now? So if you're, if you're lamenting, I would say, about what you have not done in your life, then start now because this is the, it's the continual present that we are living in. Don't lament the past, be in the present, move forward and do more loving, more enjoyable, more productive, more effective, more helpful, whatever is going to make you happy, more of that type of stuff in our lives starting now. And for those of you who have FOMO, there's actually an acronym for it, because so many millennials have FOMO, fear of missing out. Um, you know, it, I've, I have so many clients who are in the 18 to 35 year range. And some of them are Gen Xers and some of them are millennials, but you know, the fear of missing out is huge. And they get so stressed out by around 25 years old, stressed out, like unbelievably stressed out by the time they're 25, because now they only have five more years before they're 30. And if they haven't made a million dollars by their 30, because of all this crazy social media stuff, they feel like they've failed in life. They're not a celebrity like the Kardashians uh, by their time they're 30 years old and they've been a, they're a failure. There's this conscious, there's this, this, there's this silly thinking out there like that. Well, this is about this living in the present is about, you know, helps us dispense with this fear of missing out, dispense with this fear of what I've accomplished or not accomplished because it's about living in our present. So start now if that's a concern. That's the, that's the bottom line. And it doesn't matter how many lifetimes we've lived either. So Marcus kind of implies that, although he doesn't say that, 3,000 years, 30,000 years for that matter, doesn't matter. You know, no one loses any other, any other life than the one he now lives. And, you know, back then everything is he, right? So, but he or she, okay, you substitute that. What about happiness on page 13? page 13. And these numbers, 6.11, those are uh, uh, whoever first put together these meditations and so forth, you know, um, started numbering them. So <clears throat> again, these are not numbered by Marcus Aurelius himself. He just wrote these down. Um, happiness. Whenever you are forced by circumstances to be disturbed in some way, quickly return to yourself. And do not lose your footing any longer than is absolutely necessary, for you will have more control over your internal harmony by continually returning to it. So what's that sound like to those of you who've taken my other classes? That talks, he's talking about turning within, right? Turning within, connecting with ourselves in this different way 
that's not like the same way we connect with all this stuff outside, he's saying, this internal harmony. That's where we have our control over, our, over whether or not we have internal harmony. That's where we have more control than out here. You'll hear me say this, he said this a million times and you've heard, you, I've been saying this my whole lifetime. Take, more con take control over what you have control over and let go of what you don't have control over. I'll say that again, write this down. Take more control, take control over what you do have control over and let go of what we obviously don't have control over. For example, we don't have control over everybody else's <laughs> choices that they make. We don't. I'm not going to talk about free will today, but I'll just mention because we're going to talk about it in future sessions, uh, future of these monthly sessions. But um, everybody has free will. That means personal choice. They make their own choices. We do not control that. We don't control everybody else's mind. So forget about trying to control everybody else. Influence? Yeah. You can influence your children, your husband, your wife, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, whatever. You can influence, but you can't control them. That is a surefire way to sadness and suffering, is what Marcus would say. Control we can control, your internal harmony. By how? By continually, continually returning to it. What does he mean by that? By continually turning within going inside. I call it the inside-out approach. We help ourselves out inside, and then outside, we're happier. Our life goes better. We have a clearer thinking mind, is what Marcus would say, and I would agree with. We, we have a clear thinking mind by going within, turning within, strengthening ourselves. Quickly return to yourself, he says. See, whenever you are forced by circumstances, Look at the way he phrased that, okay? Whenever you are forced by circumstances to be disturbed in some way, because look, I'll use myself as an example. Uh, are we ever forced by circumstances that are beyond our control to be disturbed in some way, to use his words? Yeah, hello, I've been laid off five times in my life since I was 50 years old. <clears throat> So laid off, meaning out of work, lost my job. Why? Because some big company bought my, co my the company I'm working for and I'm out on the street because they already have two of me or three of me or one of me in a senior executive role. I'm out in the street, doesn't matter. <clears throat> doesn't matter if I'm a senior exec, right? They already got me. They got two of me already. They got three of me. Whenever we are forced by circumstances to be disturbed in some way, quickly return to ourselves, he's saying. Go inside, strengthen ourselves from the inside out. That's how we can ensure our happiness. Now, was it difficult for me <laughs> to do that? Yes, he's not saying, and I'm not saying it's easy. It's not easy, but that's the path. And that's usually not the path people take, right? I, my friends, my, my friends who are my age now, 70 years old, 65, 70 years old, yeah, you, know, they, you know, they tell me I'm their poster child for talking to their other friends who are 50, 55 years old, who got laid off from their jobs. And now they're just drinking a lot. You know, they, they're going to alcohol. They're going to what in grief counseling we call, you know, a short-term energy relieving behavior. That's not the way to happiness, right? And it's certainly not the way to get another job when you're 52 years old or whatever, you know, like I was when I got laid off. <clears throat> happiness. How about the next one? Knowledge. 6.21. Knowledge. Um, if someone is able to show me that what I think that, that what I think or do is not right, I will happily change, for I seek the truth by which no one ever was truly harmed. 
Harmed is the person who continues in his self-deception and ignorance. So what's he saying? He's saying, don't be stubborn. You know, if what you're doing isn't working, then try, try something else that's what he calls more truthful. So when, when he says, you know, he's happy to change, when he says seeking, more, seeking the truth, what does he mean by truth? He's using truth in the, in the way I would use or you would use in today in 21st century language as knowledge. Does it work? Is it working? Well, then it, if it's not working, it's not truth. It's what, not what he would call truth. This is an ancient use of the word truth. It's more knowledge, he's using, he's, he's what we would call knowledge. <clears throat> so I would say not, knowledge is not static, meaning it's a fluid process, it's ever changing. Something that may have worked in the past may not work now. So now it's not what he would call truthful for you. It's not useful, I would say. All right, he and I share this idea of pragmatism. Is it practical? Are you applying it and does it work? That's what he would call truth or truthful. You, know, you and I would say, is it practical? Is it useful? And use your common sense. You know, no one has ever been harmed, he says, by truth, by knowledge. Harmed is the person who continues in his self-deception and ignorance, which is what he's saying is, you know, keep, keep doing the wrong thing, the thing that ain't working, keep doing it. That's just self-deception. That's ignorance, you know, which leads to 6.11, unhappiness, the opposite of happiness, right? So we're always growing is really what he's saying, manifesting, how can we manifest a, a fruitful, happy and productive life is my interpretation of this. That's how we do that, is we, we exp continually expand and refine our knowledge about ourselves. You've heard me say this, some of you have taken my other classes. It's life is about expanding our capacity for experience and our knowledge about who we are as individuals. And you are each different from me, you're each different from each other, and we need to embrace that difference. There's a beauty in that diversity of who we are as different minds, different perspectives, different uh, amounts of knowledge that we each have about different things. Nobody is an expert in everything. So, so there's a beauty in that. But how can we each individually manifest the most of who we are? That's what we're saying here, okay? Conversely, as I said, by being stubborn and getting stuck in our ways, continuing to make false assumptions or to think irrationally or inconsistently, that will lead to poor decisions and our unhappiness. So shift, change, don't be afraid to change and shift if things aren't working the way you think it should be working. And not only just from a spiritual standpoint, but just from an everyday standpoint. As I said at the beginning, these are practical tips for living life. This applies to our relationships. This applies to our job. This applies to everything in our life. All of these principles in the book apply to not just, you know, spiritually, you know, it, with, with the way most people think of spiritually. See, I think of that as spirituality. To me, is my life working? And that's the way uh, a, a philosopher, a Stoic philosopher like Marcus Aurelius viewed life. Is life working for you? Are you a happy person? If it's not, then you are not a spiritual being. A spiritual being aspires to be happier and shifts and changes things that aren't working, not just in their religious life, but in their daily eyes open waking state life all the time. That is a true spiritual being from a Stoic philosopher's standpoint, and I have always viewed spirituality in that same way as well. Now, you will hear me use the word spiritual, and you'll see in there's a chapter five, spiritual, because I'm kind of uh, conforming to the way the norms of our 21st, 20th century, and 21st century culture 
even our 18th and 19th century culture views um, the idea of spirituality. But really spirituality, I think is a much more broad uh, concept and it's about happiness in the way Marcus talks about it here. It's about knowledge the way Marcus talks about it here and the way I comment on it here. <clears throat> okay. Um, so, and then the, the last one I want to touch on here, talk about for a few minutes, is the happiness and rewards. 7.73, it's on page 17 of your book if you're following along, page 17. Um, oh, actually, no, no, no. I want to talk about fulfillment first, page 16, sorry, 7.69. It's just on my same bookmark here. Uh, <clears throat> fulfillment. Fulfillment of one's character is the attainment of this, to live each day as if it were the last, to be neither agitated nor numb, and never to act with pretense. So there's a certain humility there, right? When he says lack, not acting with any pretense. Um, but what is he saying? Fulfillment of one's character. So again, remember, you got to understand from the Stoic philosopher's perspective, it's all about yourself and living a life in alignment with who you are as a being. And the being is aspiring to more knowledge and more alignment with one's truth in that way. Truth meaning knowledge, as we said in the previous maxim a few minutes ago. So fulfillment of one's character is the attainment of living each day as if it were the last, neither agitated nor numb. So it does not mean that you're living like a robot. Okay, do not misinterpret. That's a lot of misinterpretation out there about stoicism. <clears throat> this is not about robotic living. No, it's about not being overshadowed by your emotions. And those of you who have taken my other classes, you've heard me say that phrase. It's about being overshadowed. Look, those of you know, my, when my mom died, you read my other book, my first book, Overcoming the Fear of Death. And you've heard me talk very candidly about my mom dying, very young, when she was 50 years old, and I was very close to my mom. And it's very emotional for me, and it's still emotional for me. I still get sad, but I'm not overwhelmed by the sadness anymore. That's what the Stoic philosopher would say. It's not about being a robot. That's a complete misinterpretation, okay, of stoicism that some people, you'll see some, you know, modern day philosophers talk about stoicism like that. It's wrong, okay? It's, it's about not being overwhelmed. You think I wasn't hurt? You think I didn't know when I was, when, when you know, do you think that Marcus Aurelius didn't know, you know, when, when he and Faustina um, lost nine children before they were 10 years old. Of course they were told. You think it didn't register emotionally? Of course it did. But are we overwhelmed by that to the point of what in this <clears throat> being agitated or numb? <clears throat> that's the thing, okay? So Marcus's words is that's that centering point that you and I use in 21st century. We talk about being balanced and being centered, okay? Neither agitated nor numb. So was I upset when my mom died? Absolutely, yes. But was I numb or agitated? No, you know, so you wanna be in that state where yes, we're feeling the emotions, but we're not agitated or numb we're living each day as if it were the last, meaning with passion, okay? He doesn't say that, but that's what he means, right? Not robotic and never to act with pretense. You never act like you're holier than thou, arrogant, okay? We live life in that centered, inner peaceful state with humility, right? So my comment was happiness. I'll, I'm not, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but happiness is achieved when one lives more fully in the moment, in the continual present, not just physically, but also mentally and emotionally. It arises from a state of equanimity 
Equanimity means balance. We're feeling centered inside balance that resides at neither extreme, not angrily stressed out or agitated, as he said, nor robotically emotionless, or as Marcus says, numb. But neither extreme. <clears throat> so this is a big mistake. This is a big misunderstanding in 21st century spiritual circles, some of them, some of the spiritual circles, or some of the, not just spiritual circles, but some of the circles, just people who are uh, <clears throat> outside the spiritual circles too. People will think, oh, <clears throat> This guy talking about living in the moment, being balanced and present, you know, um, oh, you must be mean passivity. Oh, no, it's, you're fully engaged, fully engaged. It does not mean passivity or lack of passion. It means balance. Neither extreme is overtaking you. That's what Marcus meant by fulfillment. That's what I mean by fulfillment when I talk about fulfillment and contentment. You'll hear me use the word contentment, satisfaction. You know, it's like I was talking to a student the other day and I told her, it's like you eat a big meal because you're starving, you're really hungry and you eat a meal. It doesn't have to be a huge meal, but you're satisfied, all right? That's, the, that, that's that state of satisfaction. To me, that's, that's happiness, you know. <clears throat> And then <clears throat> happiness uh, and rewards, and, and then we'll talk about history. Um, so 7.73 on page 17, happiness and rewards. So again, he's talking about happiness here, but he's inserting a different, a new idea to the happiness thing. Uh, when you have done a good act and another has fared well by it, why seek a third reward besides these as fools do be it the reputation for having done a good act or getting something in return. So what is he saying? He's saying, do good acts to help other people just for the doing of them. Isn't there enough satisfaction in being a good person and helping other people? <clears throat> Why do you have to get the accolades? Why do you have to get the trophy? Why do you have to get the award? Why do you have to get the bump, put the bumper sticker on your car? to show your kids how great they are by being the, the, <clears throat> the best student at the whatever school, all right? Why demonstrate to your children that happiness is based on all the external rewards that other people give you? Why not demonstrate to others and especially to our children that living life, living a good life. And the way Marcus would define good life is living a life where you take care of yourself and your loved ones and, you, and your spillover helps other people. Why not revel, why not enjoy the happiness that just comes from that act, the simple pleasure of knowing we did something productive in and of itself. Why do we need the community service award? We don't. He calls those people fools. These are fools. <laughs> he uses a little bit stronger language perhaps than I would use, but you know, he calls a spade a spade. They're fools. Why does he call them fools? He uses the word fool because why? Because he's saying it's foolish. He's not saying they're, they're idiots and that, that's how we would use the word fool. So that's why I wouldn't use it in English today. But he's saying they're being foolish, they're being silly. They're not, they're, they're not being educated. They're not being knowledgeable about what they're doing because the happiness needs to come from inside as we've already talked about. So let's talk about um, the last one here. This is the last one I wanna talk about today. Page 21, 10.27, history as a teacher. This is a very, very important one uh, <clears throat> for us to teach our children and to talk about with our friends, quite frankly. You should talk about this idea with your friends and then actualize it, meaning do it uh, in life. I'll read it first. Continually be mindful of how everything that happens now 
has also happened in previous times and will happen in the future. And place before your eyes all the dramas and stage sets which you have learned either from experience or from older accounts, <clears throat> older accounts meaning from stories that you've heard, such as the royal court of Hadrian, of Antoninus, of Philip, Alexander, and Croesus, for those were the same dramas as we see now, only the actors are different. So he's talking, he's using an analogy of, of theater, right? A stage, as if we're all on a stage and we're acting out life. <clears throat> but it's all the same dramas, over thousands and thousands. Those of you who know about my history, I've, my, my memories go back 6,000 years, different lifetimes. And these, it's the same dramas being played out over and over and over again, different actors. Now, have things improved? Yes. You know, we don't have a one out of three infant mortality rate in most of the world. Some of the world still, but <clears throat> most of the world, not so, okay? Things have improved. We have soap now, you know? Not everybody had soap in the world. I mean, a simple thing like soap, you think I'm joking, I'm serious about this. A simple thing like soap, now that you're very well aware of it because of COVID-19 pandemic and people saying, you know, wash your hands 20 seconds, at least 20 seconds to kill all the bacteria. That's much longer than most people wash their hands. 20 seconds, you sing, sing twinkle, twinkle, little star three or four times. <laughs> that's, what, that's what some of them say, you know, slowly, not fast, sing it slowly. <clears throat> Soap has, has changed hygiene and disease on the planet in, a, in, in, an, in, in, in an unbelievable fashion, in terms of extending the, 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 the life expectancy rate, okay? Um, <clears throat> history as a teacher, everything that happens now has also happened in the previous times, in the past, and will happen in the future. Learn from what's going on now, he said, and in your life, and then from other people's lives previous. So he just uses Hadrian and Antoninus. As I told you, Hadrian was the emperor before him, uh, well, two emperors before him, <clears throat> who was grooming him to be emperor. And Marcus uses Antoninus because that was his stepfather, who was the emperor before him, Philip, Alexander the Great. He's just going back in history from then. Remember, these are historical figures. He's going back hundreds and hundreds and many hundreds and hundreds of years before him because he's writing this in like, you know, 170 AD, he's writing this for, people, for himself. And then other people uh, ended up reading this, right? But these are the same behaviors. What we need to look at is study the behavior, study the thinking in our past. You know, so many people just in the United States alone do not know the history of slavery in this country. They do not know the history of genocide in this country of the Native Americans. <clears throat> the Native Americans, the systematic genocide of the Native American population throughout North America <clears throat> by then the immigrants, the immigrants being all the Europeans who came to the United States before it was the United States. Right? All of that history we can learn from. <clears throat> Otherwise, as Marcus says, we'll continue to make the same behavioral blunders over and over again for millennia, generation after generation. This was good advice 2,000 years ago, and it's as valuable today as it was then. <clears throat> okay? So, um, open up for questions and so forth. But though th this is how I wanted to open, as I said, these discussions by talking about some of these maxims and showing you how those 2000 year old comments and observations by this Roman emperor, Marcus Aurelius, who was really at his heart, in his heart of hearts, a philosopher uh, from birth to death, um, <clears throat> how those ideas still impact us today and can teach us today in 21st century earth, okay? So I'm taking me off of spotlight now.
so that I can see you guys. And um, <clears throat> feel free, please, to questions. Yes, Rosary. Yes. All right. On page uh, 10. Uh huh. And it's under that the balance and perspective. You say we are not our thoughts. Mm -hmm. How many times have I read books saying <clears throat> you are what you think it? Yes. So this is the opposite of that. Yes. We are not our thoughts. Yes. So here's the, here, here, there's, there's, there's two, there's, a, here, there's some subtleties and nuances to the answer here, okay? So <clears throat> first of all, we are not our thoughts, meaning we are the experiencer of our thoughts. That's, that's point number one, write that down. We are the experiencer of our thoughts and our emotions and our experiences. Now, that may sound obvious to you, but the problem is when you are in the heat of the moment, we'll call it, and you are having an anxiety attack or you're really upset or angry about something or whatever, you forget that, okay? We all do. We've all been there. I've been there. I'm not, I'm not immune to this, <laughs> okay? I'm just like you. We've all been there, okay? But we forget that. We are the experiencer of the experiences. We are not the experiences. We are not our thoughts. We are not our emotions. <clears throat> now, obvious example of that is somebody gets their BMW scratched. These uh -huh. people are taking it even more extreme. It's like they are their BMW, right? We need to teach them first that they're not their BMW. But, you know, you, most of you are probably already past that. But for those of you who are out there are still like freaking out about your BMW getting scratched, I'm not saying that you want somebody to run a key down your BMW, okay? I've had that happen, not a BMW, but it was one of my first new cars that I ever bought and somebody ran a key down it. What am I gonna do? I gotta like, you know, it's like thousands of dollars. They literally went from the beginning, from the, what, with the, the hood of my car, the headlight all the way to the rear side and they did that. It's terrible. It's like, you, you just, it's thousands. So I never fixed it. You know, I, 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 I stuck some paint in it and so forth and that was it. But, <clears throat> so did it upset me? Yes. The point is not that it upset me. The point is, was I overwhelmed by the experience and did I lose myself in it? That is the key. Did I lose myself? That's the phrase that you want to write down. Did you, that's the test. Did you lose yourself in the experience? Then you're being overwhelmed, like Marcus talked about. We talked about one of those, right? Being overwhelmed by that, that's... That's, that's losing yourself, okay? Right, Rosary? So we are the experiencer of the experiences. We are not the experiences. Now, that, the, the other nuance to what you're saying is a little bit different. It's related, but it's a little bit different. Because tell me the quote again for everybody to refresh everybody what you just said. is what they'll say. It says... Um, not what I said, but what they'll say in these, um, other, these other classes that you've been in or read or whatever. Oh, what I just said, what? Yeah. All about, um, it's the title of a book, We Are What We Think It. We are what we think it, exactly. Yeah, we are what we think. You know, you know what you think? That's like, a, it's a catchy <laughs> title. It's incorrect and it actually leads to suffering. That's, the, pro that's the problem that I have with it. everything. You guys know me. I'm about, like I said, the beginning of this session. It's about increasing our enjoyment in life. Reduce, what's that mean? It means we reduce our suffering, right? Reduce our unhappiness. Well, that, that whole thinking, it's just, here's why it's popular, Rosary. It's popular because A, it's a catchy, pithy phrase that people can write and they go, oh, you are what you think. Oh, wow, I am what I think. Well, I never thought about it that way. Let me think about that. Oh, you're right. You mean like, I can think that I am going to, uh, be happy and oh, it made me happy all of a sudden. Uh, you know, you know, if it, it, it has these short term little, little accurate kind of examples that they can give, but it is not a universal principle the way they state it. See, that's the problem. This is where conflation comes in. So you'll hear me use this word in all of these sessions <laughs> different times. So you need to understand right off the bat what the word conflation means. And the word to conflate something is to take something and to make some and to make a misstatement out of something that actually has some basis of truth in it. 
and you see it done in politics now. Oh my God, it's all the time. It's been doing. It's been politicians have been doing this for hundreds of thousands. Well, not me, hundreds of thousands, but at least I know six thousand years uh, as long as recorded history. Politicians have been doing conflating things all the time. They'll say, they'll say, you know, um, the death toll in uh, you know from this uh, you know shooting was just like it was horrific. It was like you know da 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 da. da. It was just like uh, you know uh, you know so many people. So many people died of this, you know, the da da da, whatever happened. And it's true. Many, many people did die. But what was the number? It was eight people died, or 10 people died, or 100 people died, as compared to what I would say. You see, it's a statement, there's, a, there's some seed of truth in it, but then they'll expand on it and they'll make it like it, it, it's just, just, you know, completely exaggerate. But also, there's, there's, um, Here's another one that we'll talk about later, um, which is uh, actually maybe even better example, which is um, not just an exaggeration, it's an actual misstatement. So um, people will say, I feel really, really connected with you, Rosary. I don't know, there's something right now, I'm talking to you, you know, we're sitting at Starbucks or whatever, you know, it's like, Rosary, I just, it just is, I feel, I just is something, this is connection. You know, you said something and just, man, I just feel so connected to you. I'm, I am one with you now. I'm not one with you. I'm sitting there, Kelvin Chin, Rosary sitting there, Rosary. And if somebody looked at that, they still, still see two human beings. We're still individual separate. I'm expressing a feeling that I have. You see, that expression of that feeling is genuine. I really feel connected with you, Rosary. It's as if I'm one. But the key word is as if. And people will take that and then conflate that and they say, oh yeah, see, you had that experience, Kelvin, right? And you were in Starbucks with this woman, Rosary, and you felt this oneness with her. See, that's an example of the principle of oneness that we're talking about. We're all one. We're all one. Everybody, we're all the same. We're all one. And people need to learn that because then there'd be world peace. No, that's a conflation, you see? The feeling is genuine, but the extrapolation of it, that's not just an exaggeration, that's incorrect. You and I did not lose our individuality, Rosary. Other people would say, hey, uh, am I like, uh, do I look like this woman with the red hair? I mean, did all of a sudden, like, or like whatever, you know? No, they said like, no, Kelvin, you look like this, you shaved head guy. She just still has her hair and she did not become this bald person. They look like whatever. No, yeah, that's, that's a classic conflation, you see. So that that notion that you're talking about, that just think it and you that's who you are, that is another conflation, okay? Because yes, is there some seed to truth to it? Yes. We think bad things, we're gonna feel badly. All right? right. You know? So, but are you uh, just uh, a simple example is okay, Mr. Mr. Teacher of you are what you think. Um, uh, I'm going to tell you a thought to think right now and tell me if it worked for you. Uh, I am a millionaire. Oh, are you a millionaire now? Just from thinking that thought, you know? And they'll and they'll and they, the way they get around it is say, well, I don't have a million dollars in the bank now. But I think that I'm a millionaire. I feel like I have a million dollars. It's a baloney line, okay? It's not literal is my point. And they will work around it to try to make it a literal thing. It's not a literal universal principle, okay? We'll get to this later uh, in another session. Not, it's not one of the ones I told you about, but I am gonna make it one of the sessions maybe the seventh one, I think. I think I got six out there to you so far. But Crystal, I'm gonna give Crystal a credit here. Crystal, who's on right now. That's Crystal's daughter, by the way. That's not Crystal. <laughs> that's, Crystal that's Crystal's daughter, Everly, clutching my book, helping me sell my books. Um, but I'm gonna talk about this essay in here, the concept in the essay, basically, that Crystal inspired me to write, write, I was already in the process of publishing this book 
And I then I got to stick another essay in there. I got to write that one, Crystal. And it's, um, where was it? Where is it, Crystal? Do you see where it is? It's the, um, can we, it's something like, can we manifest every, oh, here it is, page 182. Mm -hmm. Can we manifest things in our life on page 182? And that's a, another classic thing I said, oh, just think everything, just, you know, whatever you think you can manifest, you can manifest anything in your life, just think about it, whatever. You know, <clears throat> it's a nice idea. It's inspirational to people, and I get it. It makes people feel good short term. But it creates suffering in your life when you apply that universally to every life situation. You manifested the death of your two-year-old child from cancer. All right? No, you did not do that. I am adamant about that. And I'm actually, um, I'll share something, I won't name names, but I am, uh, I am not, I'm not invited to one of these spiritual groups to speak to them anymore because uh, I am adamant about, about the truth to me, my experience on the other side and with dead children and so forth, that, that they're not, you, you didn't create that. You know, but there are people out there who firmly believe that they create everything, including the death of their child, which is a horrific, horrific sentence, death sentence to put on somebody, a, a parent. But there are, but there are groups out there who, who firmly believe that and they feel that that belief makes their parents feel better. Okay, I'm not here to change people's belief systems. I am here to educate and people who find educable information in what I teach and share with people, great. People who find it not useful <laughs> will, you know, they'll, they'll turn me off. They'll turn, they'll turn off my recording and that's okay, you know? But I'm here because I'm teaching from a, a place of consistency, right, Rosary? You know that because you've taken my other classes, right? Does that make, did that, did that answer your question enough though? Yes, it did. Yeah. I, can see, I can see the overlap where people would get confused yeah to write a whole book on it you know i <laughs> yeah it's not it's you know i'm not saying people are are, are are malintended you know it's not that they have bad intentions you know it's just a misunderstanding and i'm here to try to shift and, and show where the where the subtle sometimes it's subtle the nuanced misunderstanding can occur and it's kind of like this you know and like in physics you know it's like a this is like a reverse triangle you know, like the v it's like if you mess up something down here in physics on an atomic level you play around you mess up something down here it has huge oh, it, 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 it gets you know multiplied 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 times a trillion gazillion you know big number when it's outside right and so it's like that so i'm i want people's thinking down here to be as accurate and consistent as possible, because as as the thinking your you know shifts and becomes more consistent, then your light your behavior, and then your actions that you take, and then your life, and then your relationships, and everything else, farther out on this big V here in your life, as it manifests, to use Crystal's word from that essay, then it becomes more enjoyable, more productive, less hurtful, more giving, more loving, et cetera, et cetera. Be but the consistency down here is huge because the suffering out here is huge when the consistency down here is, is off. That's the problem that I have with some of those, those aphorisms, we'll call them, like you said, the title of that book. They're like pithy short aphorisms that sound nice when you're down here. But, but they don't realize how much they get hurt up here when they get applied way up in real life, okay? Thank you. Yeah, great question. Thank you for the question. Okay. Anything okay. else? Any other questions? Do we have a, something in the chat here? What's this? Uh, thank you. Yeah, Hazel had to go. Uh, Hazel, it's latent for Hazel in the UK. So good, but she can watch the recording afterwards. Any other questions, anything else from anybody? Okay, good, good. We'll see you guys in a month, whenever I said in May, whatever the date was. Um, those of you who are on the email list will get an email, obviously, 
reminder. Um, those of you who are maybe watching this uh, later who are not yet on the email list, feel free, just send me a message. You, uh, those of you who already have my cell phone number, you can text me. Those of you who have my email, you can email me. If you don't have my email or cell phone number, you just go to kelvinchin.org and uh, go to the contact page. In other words, go to any of my websites, quite frankly. If you have access to any of my websites, then go to the contact page, send me an email, and uh, I'll sign you up uh, for, the, uh, for the series to get the emails and the recordings afterwards. Um, okay, yeah, Rosary, go ahead. What was those numbers again, besides each of those 5.2? Oh, oh, what were the numbers? Yeah, those numbers beside each of like the 6.44, 7.59, 6.11, et cetera, yeah, 6.21. Those numbers are just numbers from this book. Okay, um, so they are numbered that way. And this book, where did they get their numbers? You see, uh, 1.15, et cetera, no. et cetera. Where do they get their numbers? They get their numbers from the original meditations by uh, you know Marcus Aurelius okay so I'll show you another book I'm not crazy about this particular translation of, of the meditations uh, but that's is another one and so if you look at this one uh, in here they he, he numbers it one two but he's numbering it they're using this consistent numbering system is my point okay so They've broken them up. You see, this one talks about book eight, other mm -hmm. the meditations of Marcus Aurelius, book eight. There's like a, a, a whole bunch of, I only picked like 20 or something of them for my, for my, like the favorite ones. But there's a lot of other ones. He talks about some family uh, thing, issue, relationship issues and so forth and so on. Marcus does in, in the, in, in the, in the, uh, in the all, you know, they call them eight books. Again, he just wrote them, he was literally writing them on sticky pads, sticky notes. You know, like <laughs> they didn't have sticky notes, but you know, his parchment sticky notes is what he was writing these on back then in his uh, torch lit tent or in the fort out in the wilderness. Well, in between battles, you know, battles would, weren't happening every day. You know, you'd have a battle and then two weeks later you have one or another month later or whatever. You know, it was, it was not a pleasant, it was, <laughs> trust me, it's not a pleasant, you know, you're away from your family and you know, you're out there in the middle of nowhere and so forth. Anyway, uh, trying to keep the empire together, but um, but no, those numbers, somebody gave those, put assigned those numbers later when they collected all the parchment papers. That's mm -hmm. all that is. Okay, but it's a way for us today to kind of navigate them because otherwise it's just a whole, it'd just be a whole pile of different, uh, okay. different, different okay. maxims. Thanks so much. You're welcome very much. You're very welcome. Everybody very welcome. And um, uh, we'll, um, yeah, Latin or Greek? Latin or Greek, Roseanne? Yeah, yeah. So um, typically Greek is what uh, Marcus was writing in for the most part, Greek. Uh, and Greek back then was, um, uh, what, what was Rome revered Greece in a lot of different ways. So Stoicism originated in Greece and so forth. And uh, many Romans were, uh, you know, were students of Stoicism. Uh, many Romans spoke Greek uh, and re re wrote and read in Greek, uh, especially, the, you know, obviously the more educated ones. Um, and it was considered the, it was kind of like, um, it's, it was kind of like analogous Greek then, it was kind of analogous like English is today. It's considered like the language, you know, the, you know, the, the, the accepted language in like, uh, for example, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I, I don't fly airplanes, but um, I have this pilot thing uh, mm -hmm. in me. And so I, I watch some YouTube videos and doesn't matter where you are in the world, they're speaking English from the control towers, okay, typically, right? English is the is the common language, so um, and uh, in, in in back in this 1800 18th century in the 1700s, French was the language. French was the language, not German, not English. So it was after that that English became what we now know as the the common world language. But French was 
the language back in the 18th century. Yeah, international law is written in French. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, but back 2,000 years ago, Greek was it. Greek. Yeah, okay. yeah. Good question. Great. Good time. to see everybody. Bye take bye. care. We'll see you in a month. And uh, take care now. Okay. Bye bye. Be safe. Thanks, Carol. You're welcome.